everyone. Um, thanks for coming. We'll start getting ready to start the talk. So this show uh, was suggested by Colleen O'Donnell. And she and I work together at the Pennsylvania Academy. She teaches a terracotta sculpture class. And the artists in the show take class with Colleen for uh, quite a long time. So it's more than a class. It's not just that. It's a communal working environment, I think. Colleen will talk more about that. So um, we're very excited for the show. I think it's great. And thank you for coming. And we'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Colleen, and she can introduce the artists yeah. and speak about uh, the show, them, and how it all came together. So uh, okay. thanks, Colleen. <laughs> Participated. Um, one of the things I love about the academy and about uh, the class, and even you know when I was a student there, of course I went there, and uh, as a teacher is that you know everybody is different, you know, and and that's what I love about it. You know, we all work from the same model, but but we all have different work, <laughs> you know, different outcomes. And that's what I love about art too, you know, these, these differences that people have, and because you're you're expressing yourself uh, as you're making something and being creative in uh, whatever genre that is. Um, so I guess I'll introduce the artist is Alexandra Griffin. Terracotta means uh, fired clay, it's Italian. So any, really any clay that's cooked is, is called terracotta clay. There's um, brands of clay you can buy that's called terracotta clay, but that, that's not actually what it is, it's just clay. It's not until it's fired that it's called terracotta. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I love it, you know, it's of the earth, right? They dig it up and minimal processing. And, and you're, you're good to go. I mean, we, we go from mud to this, you know? So it's really, it's really a wonderful process um, to, to be a part of. And um, in, in the clay, there's uh, something called grot, which is a sand which holds the clay together, you know, so it's not literally like mud. And um, so the, the clay we use has very little uh, fine grot, so you can get the fine details, um, as opposed to if we were making a big pot or something architectural, then you would get something that has a lot of grog and a lot of texture in it. Um, so, you know, there's really a wide variety, and, and people like to experiment with different clays. The color is just different color, you know, different colors of the earth, right? So that's, um, this is a dark red when it's uh, in the bag, and this is a dark gray, and then after it gets cooked, you know, it, it changes color. Um, so how that happens, what we do is um, we, you know, finish these up and then let them dry for, you know, a month or, or so, and it gets leather hard on the outside, and then we flip it over and hollow it out, so they're, most of them uh, have a good amount of clay that's hollow, and that just helps the whole process, you know, the heating process, and keeps everything even, so nothing explodes. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and then it dries it uh, another month or two months, and uh, then it goes into a, an electric kiln, and the kiln uh, is, is run at a slow, slow pace again, you know, because uh, they're not coffee cups, those you can, you know, <laughs> and they're fine. So uh, we run the kiln at 200 degree increments up over 12 hours and 200 degree increments down over 12 hours. And it goes up to around 1800 degrees. Um, so 
so they want to make sure the kiln is full <laughs> before they put that electric on. Um, so yeah, and then and then we're done, you know. And then you know you can paint it if you want, or uh, there's of course glazes. Not too many people care for glazes, but uh, there's a lot of options uh, after they're done. But again, you know, it's sculpture, so all you really need is some light. <laughs> you know, you don't really need a lot of that stuff. I think the other artists can jump in and maybe talk a little bit about their own work. All right. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I'm Peggy And um, I walked into Colleen's studio at PAPA in 2009. She called up and said, come take my class. And, um, and I did. And I was so glad because it had been 30 years since I had done any artwork. I had studied with a sculptor in my teens and early 20s. And I was suffering from not doing it. Um, and, I, and so I walked into that seventh floor room, um, that new building, and you can see City Hall and you can see Broad Street and feel this connection to the whole city and to the artists that are in that studio with Colleen. And Colleen will bring in a, a book that will influence my work that day, whether it's on Mang Zhu or uh, Mary Frank or something, and I can find myself feeling that immediate influence. But um, I also had a lot of disregard for my own work, and I was careless with it. And after um, that first class, I took it home and thought that I would do a studio practice, but I didn't. It, my studio was really dormant. And actually, the two pieces that I had made, which were heads of Kevin in that class, they broke, and um, and I I uh, I did a lot of work to reconnect and get back into a studio class with uh, Colleen, which I did a couple of years ago, and took these broken pieces, and Colleen will uh, and Britta and the, um, who runs the kiln, yeah. <laughs> uh, are wonderful resources to try to explain to me how to keep a neck from breaking. <laughs> <laughs> but all my necks broke. <laughs> and then I decided I liked it, and the one that survived the kill, I ended up taking a mallet and a chisel <laughs> and, <laughs> cut and I removed his head. <laughs> because a lot of the things that I was working with were um, feeling disconnected from my own body. And um, some trauma around uh, that chakra, around the neck, and not being able to voice or breathe and, and um, have a sort of a dissociation at certain times. Anyway, so these pieces reconstructed. There was also uh, the one on the right is called Rebuild. And um, I'd often wondered how you do a relief piece. So this was an easy way to get to uh, a relief, a sculptural relief. Um, and at the same time, a woman walked into my studio, a lovely woman that I photographed, and her daughter. And um, I learned that her husband was incarcerated. And some of those issues of separation, family separation, et cetera, were what I were dealing, was dealing with in that piece. And then uh, sometimes I was all prepared to come to the studio. And I had <laughs> no tools, and I didn't pick up terracotta. And Colleen handed me this clay, which is a self-drying clay. She said, use this. So that's when I did this portrait um, of the model, uh, Michael, at, at um, Papa. And it does dry by itself. You don't even <laughs> need the kiln. <laughs> the discoloration uh, did not please me. And so I ended up taking graphite powder and using graphite powder and fixative. And, um, and that I quite like. And then I started using dry pigments on, on pieces also still dealing with that idea of disconnection, but also healing and the circulatory system and the nervous system. And this blue piece, I think it's called uh, the color blue, not fantasy, but freedom, which is a quote from Louise Bourgeois, who does draws on her own personal trauma to create the critical culture. So that's um, a unified theme there. 
and then also the respiratory system and figuring out how you take the trauma of the throat and mounting these heads, connecting with picking wood as a material, thinking of uh, wood as a as a nervous system. I mean, wood trees as a nervous system for our earth and uh, some one mounted on stone, that cold stone idea of not not being able to breathe. And uh, these two torsos were um, have been weathered. Uh, this before it was fired was left in the rain, thus the name rainfall, and was crumbling. And I like all of the illusions that that brings to a piece. And then um, was fired and then put in plaster to stabilize it. And this one has been in the weather and has a little bit of that lichen growing on it, which I like too. And then these uh, heads, easy unfinished, uh, unfinished heads that I had done in Colleen's class in 2009 and left. Um, and so now I'm so happy to be back in the classroom and with these other people back in the studio where uh, I don't let things dry out. <laughs> I work them to a more finished state, and I think all that's progress. <laughs> PCA back then it was called uh, for painting and uh, was a painter for most of my adult life and um, my husband and I were on a trip in Italy and we went to a little archaeological museum in this little town and I saw a head about this size uh, Etruscan head but with the, the Greek style and I just was transfixed by it it just moved me and I don't know why but it was just so beautiful Gary said you should take a sculpture class like, so I did, and then I'm lucky enough, and it was, it was a terracotta head. Lucky enough, um, you know, Colleen was teaching, and uh, so I got into the class, completely had no idea what to expect, never done sculpture before, and um, it was really hard. It was so hard, it was like drawing 365 degrees. I was used to doing two-dimensional images, but three-dimension was just totally a whole nother Dimension. <laughs> so anyway, I feel like I graduated from two dimension to three dimension. So it was like a few years. It took me a while just to get comfortable with the clay, the materials, the tools, figuring out how the proportions of the body works. The you know the muscles going in, the muscles going over that way, and you know all this stuff. It's so hard to get it all right all the way around. And um, once I kind of got that, felt a little bit more comfortable with that, then I thought, well, put these things in context, so they're just not orange naked people. <laughs> <laughs> so I started off, actually, the first thing I did, I started off, this is my first guy, I kind of got a little bit away from um, just the, the figure, and I added an hourglass, you know, like a big deal, right? <laughs> Tempest Fujit, that's what I call it. So this was, this was like a new thing for me. Okay, I can do props. I always liked our allegorical paintings and um, knew a little bit about uh, mythology from all, you know, studying art history. So then I thought, okay, props. So this was the first one, and then probably the second one I did with a lot of props was fortune over there, and um, everything means something. You know, there's the, the castle on her head is home, ball is like Capricious fortune, the wheel of fortune she's holding, and the Cornucopia in the back um, means like the gifts that fortune can bring if you're lucky enough. Anyway, so that that was that. So that was fun. But then, um, well, we had this. Um, well, first of all, I have to say that Tina and Mike wrote this great description on the card, and they used three words that really hit with me, and that was inspiration, frustration, and redemption. <laughs> um, uh, for me, it was more like frustration, inspiration, and then redemption. Um, and frustration. And then, uh, absolutely. There's a lot of, lot of frustration going around. involved in all of these stages. But um, there was a particular model that we had that was, um, it was kind of lazy. You didn't, you took really long breaks. <laughs> shifted around a lot and was really hard to work with. 
So I really wasn't all that happy with how I finished him because it was just like a, a rough time. So I didn't finish it at that semester and I brought the sculpture home and I kept it wet so I could keep working on it. But I was like, what am I gonna do with this guy? It was like, so boring and I really didn't have a good vibe towards him. So um, all of a sudden the inspiration came and I thought, I'm going to make him into a satyr. I'm going to do an operation, chop off his legs, and give him goat legs. <laughs> you know, it's like my, you know, getting back at him for being such a lazy guy. Anyway, so, over, so he's over there. He's a, the new satyr is over there. And he wasn't, believe me, the model was not amused or amusing. <laughs> but I really enjoyed... Um, I really enjoy transforming him into a non-human thing. <laughs> I mean, I really felt powerful, like, like a god of some sort. Yeah. And um, so anyway, that, that started it. And then um, it was just so much fun to create my own reality, in a way, you know? So, um, so then after that, you know, Colleen, every time she'd come by, she'd say, how's it going? What are you doing? And I was like, Okay, it's going well, but I think I'm going to make this guy into a, instead of giving him legs, I'm going to give him two fishtails for legs. <laughs> and she would say, oh, cool things. <laughs> Which meant, you know, go for it. And uh, so I would, and then she would, the best thing about Colleen is that she would um, encourage me, try to, know, she knew where I wanted to go, and help me get there. And um, so anyway, so that's, that's pretty much all the other things. Um, are kind of happy like that. Although I, I have to say I kind of do things backwards than probably most sculptors who do subjects like these subjects. Usually they start off with an idea and then get to model the pose that way. But in our case, it's in my case especially, it's backwards because we choose a pose as a class. You vote on a pose and so then I like work out the rough idea of the figure and then I'm thinking all along. How can I change this? What, what mythological person can I make? What can I do to this figure to make it more interesting for me? And that's what happens. Is Prometheus yours? Yes. Was, did he pose that way? Yeah, I was going to say, we he don't did. chain our minds. <laughs> <laughs> that look of agony, though. I had the eel. Like, I had the eel there, but he flew away. <laughs> no, yeah, Prometheus, actually, uh, that was another early one. Um, with, with just before I started changing the bodies. He was posed that way, yeah. but he was more laying flat. Mm -hmm. So I put him up, so get that more of a thing. And I actually gave him that, that anguish. Yeah, that you know, like, <laughs> really, like I would curl up my toes, and it's like, if I'm, in, if I'm sore, how would my toes look? You know? <laughs> and so then I would sculpt my toes and put him on him. <laughs> so yeah, that's what cool. Hi, my name's Alexandra. Um, my sculpture is the resin piece in the middle of the room. When I sculpt, it's very spontaneous and it's lively and I'm always having a lot of fun. And it's so nice to get to know other sculptors who understand that energy. Um, taking classes at Papa, I've learned a lot about anatomy and I've been inspired by other artists. Like Suzanne inspires me very much. Uh -huh. Um, I just, um, I've met so many wonderful people and um, I've grown a lot. Um, so this sculpture just started out with plain wet clay and then I made a rubber mold from that and then with the rubber mold I, I cast resin in it. And then there's a metal base because I've been experimenting with metal recently but I, I didn't make the base, I just wanted a simple clean base. Um, I've done a lot of different uh, things with my life, and I feel like art is the thread that's connecting everything. I keep going back to art, and I keep making art, and I just have to accept the fact that I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to live with it. It's just the way it is. Um, as far as a personal meaning for this sculpture, um, I love children, and I've worked with children in the past, and there's something magical about that little smile, and I love a smiling face. 
And also, I was thinking about the, how be, becoming an artist is going to change my life in the future. And I want to hold on to that spark of that creativity. And um, So it's my little elf with my little spirit, my little heart spirit. <laughs> working with all these folks, um, and uh, I appreciate what everybody had to say. Um, Colleen didn't tell us about her work. I'd love to hear about that. <laughs> her work's yeah. awesome, too. I mean, it's just great. So um, I wasn't 100% sure what to say, because my uh, process, these are my two pieces here that you, uh, they turned out white. Um, like uh, Colleen said, they started out dark gray. And um, so my process was really about, um, more about seeing really straightforward, just going to a class and trying to learn how to see. Um, and I heard um, mentioned that, uh, you know, the difference between seeing two-dimensionally and three-dimensionally. You know, you think you're seeing three-dimensionally until you, step, you sit and try to, you know, create something three-dimensionally. And I remember the first time that I did see the third dimension, and I was not four years old or five years old. I was, like, in my late teens or something. And I had a, um, a teacher who said, um, well, all of my sculpture teachers were telling me that I was too frontal, that I was sculpting as a painter, you know, like drawing the scene in relief and then shifting and drawing it again in relief. And, it sh and I had no idea what they were talking about, and I just figured they didn't get me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they didn't see my vision or whatever that. But, um, but one day, um, I went out. This is when the Academy of Fine Arts was over at the Peel House. Uh, and uh, we went to Rittenhouse Square and drank a bit. <laughs> this was an earlier time in my life. Anyway, um, but uh, came back with like a different perspective. And, um, I was working on this bus, which again was like a big cube. It was like basically relief drawings. And I came in and uh, chopped off one of the corners of the cube and had this moment, you know, where I saw this plane right here, mm -hmm. this plane, mm -hmm. and it was a, it was huge, and I never unsaw it after that. Um, so I'm so into that, I so love that, it's so delicious, and you mentioned, uh, Suzanne, uh, the graduation from two years ago. Um, that's what it felt like, it felt like this blows painting away. <laughs> um, I, I love painting, and I still paint, and I'm actually doing painting right now, but, um, um, but the, you know, it does feel like it's a, it's a whole different side of the brain. Um, anyway, so the process that I really appreciated learning from from Colleen in this class was this idea that you could fire um, figure uh, pieces because I had done uh, pieces on armatures up to that point, which are basically um, you know there's a there's a, a metal skeleton holding the weight of this clay, and as you build more up, the weight becomes more significant, and you need something to keep it from doing this. Um, but what we did was, um, with Colin's direction, was just, what is it, chopsticks, or like, yeah. like pencils, or you know what I mean? Like little chopsticks, or, or <laughs> just enough, you know what I mean? You're sort of, it's sort of that tension between um, how much clay can I pile onto this small piece that will then easily pull out or burn out. Right? Um, anyway, so that, that was sort of a, a big opening. In fact, uh, there's a hole right here at the top of this uh, model's head where the, where the stick was. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, for me it was just about um, you know, learning to, to, to sculpt in this scale. I had, I've been used to sculpting larger and to shrink my uh, ability to see down to that scale. And then just in general, just, just trying to see in three dimensions trying to see that you know the two dimension that I'm looking at has something coming towards me, has something going back, um, and trying to not forget that. You know, and, and the, um, the moments of, of exploding ahas, you know, when you're, when you're in this quiet space with all these serious people, um, and serious models too, you know, everybody's, everybody's there for the same reason, really. Um, and these, these quiet moments of, you know, inspiration that happen when you when you suddenly see 
oh, right, you know, it just, it sort of clicks somehow. It's really hard to explain, but, and I'll close with this, this idea, I've heard somewhere that maybe this whole thing is a simulation and we're all, you know, that our entire lives are really being projected onto a two-dimensional screen. Have you heard this? This is all really just a video game. Yeah. That's what you said. Yeah. Uh, this, this idea I know can't be right because uh, to me, I'm not convinced that the person who's, who's, who's uh, positing that um, idea has ever seen the third dimension. You have to prove to me that you've seen the third dimension or else I don't believe you have. Anyway, um, take that for what you want. But anyway, it's been, it's been a joy to be a part of this and uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>
Any questions for anybody? Feel free to ask. I have just one. Yes. I'm looking at the faces of the children and they look very diverse. Is that on purpose? Yes, yes. These are all um, stylized, like I say, it's based on my own uh, experience, but um, I, I wanted a universal feeling to it, so I didn't. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I wanted that diversity. Does that include the, the woman? Is, is that yeah. an archetype or is that your yeah. mother? No, it's an archetype. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. I just wanted to ask if anyone had a comment about the value of all working together. Since it seems like that's a big part of why you decided to have the show. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's really, I think it's really valuable. There's a certain energy in there that, uh, that we get that kind of feeds off. Yeah, I'll follow that up. Oh, too. Uh, I did have a studio and I couldn't, it was so, I was alone mm -hmm. and um, I couldn't make progress. But in that, in Colleen's studio with these other women and men, there was a wonderful young man who was. Um, Colleen's class because he wanted to be a tattoo artist and he felt like he needed to understand more about the human figure mm -hmm. and um, but the influence that I get definitely and sometimes I have gotten very depressed when someone will make an observation uh, in the class and I have to think about it but it takes me further and I wouldn't have that challenge in the studio by myself it's really the, the comments observations and critiques of studio makes them. It's huge. And plus the laughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll second that. Um, we have a lot of we have a lot of fun. We're like a little posse, the people who have been taking classes with Colleen for a while. Uh, we all have our own little in jokes and whatever. But um, it is really helpful to have somebody else just wander over during a break and say, make some like random comment that all of a sudden is like ding 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 ding. And uh, it's happened with all of us. So it's very valuable. I agree. I mean, I like the time alone because then I can just really focus and think. But there is, it's really special to have time where you can exchange uh, ideas and thoughts and, you know, it's obviously. And we're all good friends. You know, it's, it's fun. I give a lot of credit to Colleen also for creating a certain vibe. Yeah. Because I've definitely been in um, tons of classes. And it's an unusual um, atmosphere in that it's very, um, it's not hierarchical so much, although obviously we know who the wise one in the room is. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's really, there's a, there's a equality uh, in, in the space and um, uh, a real collaboration. Um, and people actually go out and have lunch and socialize, and that's kind of amazing. That's something for me that's kind of unusual. Uh, within an art class, it's really easy to kind of get into that quiet, meditative space and stay in that space, you know, and like not break out of it. Uh, and also seeing the way other people respond to the same stimulus, right? And, and seeing that in live time and seeing that develop, uh, you can't, you know, you can't explain how, how great that is. So, yeah. I wanted to ask uh, the artist about the relationship between the sketching, warm up or framing, and then how do you know when to go to the clay? It, is it just your hands get hungry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd go with that. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. But actually, can, Colleen, you should talk about how we start, like the first class. Yeah, of the a first semester. class we have, uh, we do gestures, if you're familiar with gesture drawing. Mm -hmm. Those are short poses and drawing, they're like one to five minutes or something, but for us they're 20 to 40 minutes, you know. Mm -hmm. It's in clay. It's, it's in clay, you know. Oh, we start yeah, we're doing clay, clay sketches. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we do like uh, three or four of those, and then and then we have a vote, and then we pick one. Um, pick a pose, we, yeah. You know, sometimes we make adjustments or whatever yeah. for the long pose. 
usually have two poses a semester, a male and a female. Right. You know, so you get different body types and things like that too, uh, different models every semester. So it keeps us on our toes. <laughs> This scale, you can kind of move it around. Yeah. Than also, it's clay. Yeah. It moves. It's yeah. malleable. It's not stone. Right. You know. Right. Right. It's like you're supposed to. It's supposed to be more of an additive process. But I'm always adding and subtracting. Adding <laughs> and subtracting. <laughs> oh, 